Hello and welcome to the political history of the United States. Episode 3.4, The Salem Witchcraft Trials. Back when I was in high school and I learned about colonial American history, there were three events that I learned about that occurred prior to 1763 and the run-up to the American Revolution. The first was the Pilgrim's Landing in Plymouth, the second was the Salem Witchcraft Trials, and the third and final thing was that the French and Indian War was indeed a thing. On this podcast, we've already discussed the Pilgrims, and we will be wrapping up this season with the French and Indian War. Today, however, we are going to turn to the second of those three events, and we are going to begin looking at the Salem Witchcraft Trials. We are going to start by taking a look at the brief history of exactly what happened, before switching gears and looking at the causes and the long-term effects of what has become one of the most famous events in colonial American history. So this week's episode is going to be a blow-by-blow narrative of exactly what went down in Salem during 1692. Next time, when we come back, we are going to examine those questions of why it all happened, as well as looking at the long-term repercussions and the ultimate legacy of the Salem Trials. In February of 1692 in the town of Salem Village, now Danvers, Massachusetts, two girls, one of which was the daughter of the town's minister Samuel Paris, began having what was described as fits. The diagnosis for the girls was that they had been bewitched by Paris' slave, Tituba. Of very serious concern for those residents in Salem Village was that Tituba admitted to having knowledge of Caribbean religious practices. She was promptly arrested and held, though, interestingly enough, despite pushing over that first domino getting everything going, she was ultimately going to survive the ordeal. What the situation with Tituba had done is that it had put an entire colony on edge. Nobody knew at this point that they were about to embark on one of the most famous bouts of mass hysteria in American history, in an event that has become the paradigm for such hysteria and persecution. What they knew is that a slave girl in their colony had admitted to practicing Caribbean religious practices and apparently had bewitched the family of Samuel Paris. For those making the accusations, and typically they were made up of the younger women of the colony, their descriptions describe them as having fits. These fits would generally include convulsions, strange body movements, screaming, and talking nonsensically. These fits were often accompanied by outbursts of violence as well. Those making the accusations claimed that they were seeing visions, called specters, of people attempting to bewitch them. These specters were often accused of torturing their victims, hence explaining their erratic behavior. Accusations of witchcraft were nothing new in 1692. While they had become less prevalent over the last century in Europe, they did remain a rare but not completely unheard of occurrence in the colonies. Prior to the events of 1692, 24 people in Massachusetts had been accused of witchcraft, with five of those being executed. This means that roughly every two and a half years, somebody in Massachusetts was going to be accused of being a witch. Other colonies in New England also dealt with their own accusations of witchcraft, with Connecticut being the leader in New England. Just years before Edmund Andros himself had presided over a witchcraft trial in Boston. In that particular case, the accused, Anne Glover, admitted to being a witch. She made a whole lot more confessions during that trial and admitted that she did torture children using said witchcraft, and was even accused by her husband of torturing a young girl to death through witchcraft. She was ultimately sentenced to death and thereafter executed. It is worth noting that in the case of Anne Glover, there was tacit recognition by the authorities in Boston, chiefly by Andrus himself, that she may have been suffering from mental illness as he did order her to be examined prior to the execution being carried out. It is likewise noteworthy that this took place in 1688 and would mark the final execution ever in Boston for witchcraft, which goes to show that despite the fact that it did spread out a little bit as we are going to see, the witchcraft fervor of 1692 remained mostly contained within Salem. Well, the Tituba accusation in February came first, It was the allegations made in early March that is really going to kick off the events as we know it. During her interrogation, Tituba made a series of confessions, 
that would highlight the involvement of not just herself, but also of the widows, Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne. Tituba pointed out that it was actually Good and Osborne that were the ringleaders, and that she was acting under their influence, and had in fact been tortured by them for her disclosures. By this point, word was quickly spreading throughout the village as more and more complaints began to arise, often taking the form of spectral visions. It was Anne Putnam Jr. who was really about to kick things into overdrive when, at the beginning of March 1692, she accused Dorcas Good, the daughter of Sarah Good, of choking her, and then shortly thereafter, Elizabeth Proctor of tormenting her. Very shortly thereafter, it was Anne Putnam Jr telling her parents that she was being tormented by Martha Corey. In the case of Tituba, as well as with Sarah Osborne and Sarah Good, the accusations were less shocking. All three were women who were far more likely to be accused of witchcraft than men. Tituba was a slave, so it was far easier to point suspicion at her. Plus, she had given what was, by all accounts, a pretty convincing confession. Osborne and Good were both widows, which made them both more suspect. Not to mention that nobody was at all surprised by the news that Sarah Good had been accused of witchcraft. For her daughter Dorcas Good, there was a sense of guilt by association. Elizabeth Proctor, likewise, was not a surprising allegation either. Her grandmother had been accused in 1669 of being a witch. Much like with Dorcas Good, there was a degree of guilt by association that would come to haunt Proctor. However, it was the next wave of women being accused that is really going to start the panic. Martha Corey was a member of the church and she was in good standing. She was married and prior to this, there had been nothing to suggest that anything was amiss. Her being accused extended events from a place where people could not along and understand the accusations to hitting at the very heart of the community. Through the next several months of 1692, the allegations are coming not towards outcasts, but rather towards prominent members of society. The investigators, obviously wanting to make sure that they're doing a good job, gave young Ann Putnam Jr. a task. They needed her to pay particular attention to the clothing that Corey Specter was wearing. This became one of the primary ways that those investigating the claims of witchcraft would positively identify their specters. Regrettably, later in the day when Putnam saw a specter, Martha Corey was blinding her. But despite that, Putnam did conveniently state that the specter was indeed Martha Corey. With the only logical conclusion apparently being that this was witchcraft, the job now jumped to questioning Martha Corey herself. Corey denied the allegations against her and was careful to remind everybody that she was one of them. And Putnam Jr. all the meanwhile continued hurling accusations against others in the community such as Rebecca Nurse. Like Corey, Nurse was a respected member of the town and not somebody that would have quickly been assumed to be part of some occult ritual. Making matters worse was a mid-March meeting between Martha Corey and Thomas Putnam, Anne's father. As soon as Corey entered the house, Ann Putnam Jr. fell to the floor and suffered one of the most profound fits to date. Her story about what she saw did more to convince the townspeople of her story than anything else that had happened so far, and firmly cemented Corey's place as a potential witch. Corey was then interrogated on March 21st, where, to the consternation of everybody, she continued to refuse to confess. More problematically for everybody at this point is that the number of people making accusations was growing as well. Not only did this mean that more people were accused, but it also meant that those previously accused were suddenly facing new accusations from other people. This helped to lend support to the original claims being made. Furthermore, lest any of you think that these are open-minded investigations, the questions being asked were exceptionally leading. The questions were asked in the form of accusations. For example, Drain and Putnam Jr.'s fit I spoke of a moment ago, the one that took place when Corey walked into the house. She mentioned that Corey had attacked the Putnam's maidservant, Mercy Lewis, as well. Lewis confirmed these reports. The questions to Corey were therefore not, did you ever hit Mercy Lewis? 
but was rather, what did you hit Mercy Lewis with? The framing of the questions gives a good indication on where the minds of the said investigators were by this point. By the end of March, there was palpable fear that had spread throughout the colony. Everybody had become suspicious of everybody else, to such an extent that the accusations were appearing in order to prevent suspicion falling onto others. Giles Corey, the husband of Martha Corey, for example, claimed that shortly after the allegations against his wife, a supernatural force had stopped him from praying while pointing the finger at his accused spouse. Not only did this reinforce the fears that were now abounding throughout Salem, but added gasoline to an already growing fire. Panic by this point had gripped Salem Village. People were reporting seeing specters everywhere, often referring to seeing the great black man, who those in the know assured Sears was the devil. The church by this time could no longer ignore what was going on and had sermons directly discussing the power of the devil. Rather than calming things down, it did little but convince the entire town that they were indeed in the midst of a crisis. Everything that was happening in Salem Village, well, that was the devil. He was present and he was the one orchestrating current events. Samuel Paris, who, if you'll recall, his daughter had made those first allegations, had become an increasing firebrand throughout the colony, preaching that it was witches, leading to all of their problems. Nurse and Quarry marked just the first two people who held prominent places in society to be accused. By the end of March, Nurse's sister would also be accused of witchcraft, which was surely aided by her sister, already having had the finger pointed at her. The church was, however, left with a serious problem. With its members under fire, the job of protecting the institution fell into the hands of Paris. The answer was reminding people that, well, Christ lives in the church, so could the devil. In this way, Paris had managed to argue that the devil had infiltrated the Salem church, reminding the practitioners that the devil can take many forms. For those accused, this is another devastating blow. Those who fell in line with the church doctrine suddenly lost their best shield against allegations being made as they were suddenly Satan's spies within the church. The next developments came in late April, when allegations were thrown towards Bridget Bishop and Abigail Hobbs. In the case of Bishop, she lived in Salem Town, not Salem Village, a hint that the crisis was now spreading. Accused first by Ann Putnam Jr., and then soon thereafter by Mercy Lewis and Mary Walcott, Hobbs was roughly the same age as her accusers. What made Hobbs unique, however, is that she was the third confession following Tituba and Dorcas Good. During her interrogation, Hobbs would describe hurting the girls who accused her, and described entering into an agreement with the great black man, further feeding into the idea that he represented the devil. Likewise, Hobbes had made a comment that she had met the devil near Casco Bay. As we're going to discuss next week, Casco Bay is located near the southern portion of Maine, in an area where war with the Indians was still raging. The colonists in Salem were very concerned during this period of an actual Indian menace to their north. Having Hobbes testify of the vision of the devil at Casco Bay helped further fuel a panic that had been omnipresent during the entire event and indeed for years. This is the same Indian threat that Edmund Andrus was dealing with in 1689 when he suddenly had to rush back to Boston to get control of events. Now, just keep this in your mind for the time being and we'll discuss it more in our next episode. I did, however, just want to get it out there because the foundation is going to be laid by Abigail Hobbs. Throughout April and May, there is a sudden uptick in the number of allegations being made. And while a large number of the accusations are being made against those who are already accused and in jail, there is still a number of new people being accused throughout the spring of 1692. Likewise, the number of accusers was also on the rise. Sure, Anne Putnam Jr. kept herself busy by making accusations throughout the spring. However, new girls joined in and made their own accusations. For those living in the Bay Colony, the more pragmatic question was also starting to come to the forefront. Chiefly, at some point, the colony was going to need to make a plan to act on all those accused. Indeed, by the time that May rolled around, preparations were being made for what was going to be the single largest series of witchcraft trials in the history of New England, 
either before or after. Now, I'm not going to go through each individual that was accused, nor every allegation that was made. Otherwise, this is going to take us forever. However, I want to throw out some general statistics to give you a sense of the scope of the events that were sweeping through Salem. In the end, 19 people would end up making the claim to be a victim of witchcraft. Of that group, they ranged in age from 9 years old, which was Betty Paris, up to 36 in Sarah Viber. The vast majority of those claiming to be afflicted by witchcraft were 20 and under, with Viber and Ann Putnam Sr. being the only two older than 20. Of the 19, 17 of the accusers were women, with John Indian and John DeRich being the male accusers. As a quick aside, John Indian was indeed an Indian and was also the spouse of Tituba. All involved in making the accusations made numerous claims, with Mary Walcott leading the way with 69 allegations. A number of the other girls, including Anne Putnam Jr. and Mercy Lewis, made in excess of 50 allegations of witchcraft each. In regards to the number of the accused, this number does jump around a little bit depending on where I'm reading. However, in general, it seems to have been somewhere between 100 and 250 people. Of those, approximately 31 were officially charged and tried. Finally, and this will be an important point for next week's episode, of the accused, approximately 43 of them would end up naming others as witches when facing accusations of their own. The key fact on this is that among those who name others as witches, all of them would survive the upcoming trials. As we are going to discuss, this may well explain the spread of the allegations, considering that based on the numbers, making an allegation against others in the colony once you had already been accused was a pretty good way to keep yourself alive. Without any question, the vast majority of those involved in the witchcraft trials are women, both accusers and accused alike. However, that is not to say that there are no men involved. Ann Putnam Jr. stated that she had begun to see the specter of one of her former caretakers, John Willard. Putnam made the claim that this particular specter had confessed to the murder of her baby sister, who had died back in 1689. Upon an arrest warrant being issued for Willard, he made an attempt to flee the village. However, it was captured a few days later by John Putnam Jr. Other men would be accused and executed as well during the proceedings, despite the fact that women were in fact the primary target. As the spring of 1692 was winding down, the issue became how to deal with the still increasing number of accusations spreading throughout the colony. More concerning for many is that the allegations of witchcraft were now beginning to spread outside the confines of Salem. Surrounding villages such as Andover and Gloucester now saw allegations beginning to infiltrate their villages. While interrogations were continuing, new tests were being developed to prove who was and who was not a witch. Some of these tests were as simple as having the accused touch the afflicted and gauge the reaction. Unsurprisingly, this did little to disprove the accusations and rather helped to reinforce that what was going on was indeed witchcraft. Likewise, we will see that a common test became asking the accused to say the Lord's Prayer. An inability to do so meant that they were a practicing witch. For the new governor of the colony, William Phipps, this rash of accusations needed to be dealt with. There was going to need to be trials that firmly established the guilt or innocence of those accused, as well as dole out punishments. Now, recall from our previous episode that William Phipps' time as governor had literally just begun. Phipps had arrived in the colony on May 14, 1692, to begin his time as the governor. By this time, we are months into the crisis that was gripping Salem. So, for Phipps, we have him taking office in the middle of a serious crisis gripping his colony. We know that within days of his first council meeting, one that was far more about pomp and ceremony than any real business, he held a meeting to discuss the crisis going on in Salem. Advising Phipps on what to do next was a group within his council that had been among the primary interrogators in Salem. Amongst this group were Samuel Sewell and William Strawden. 
Phipps made the call at the end of the council to set up a special commission to deal with the witchcraft crisis. What Phipps decided on was that there was going to be a court made up of nine judges to decide the fate of those accused in Salem. So, who are our judges? The chief justice of the newly appointed court of Oyer and Terminer, the court that was going to hear the witchcraft cases, was William Strauden. Strauden has been in our story for a while now, having been one of the first two representatives to travel to England to help avoid the Quo Warranto against the Bay Company's charter. Likewise, he was one of the elites close with Cotton Mather, and likely an orchestrator of the 1689 Boston Revolt that overthrew Edmund Andros. Joining him was Jonathan Corwin, Bartholomew Gedney, Peter Sargent, Nathaniel Saltonstall, John Richards, Waitstall Winthrop, John Hawthorne, and Samuel Sewell. For the judges, there was the challenge of figuring out just how to have trials and give the appearance of due process. As we are going to see in a moment, making the argument that due process is being provided for, well, at the same time allowing convictions based on spectral evidence, was troubling and was a concern that the judges themselves were not oblivious to. This gets to a subject that we are going to cover more next week, but there is the fact that even among the judges, there is always a degree of discomfort with what they are doing. Certainly not from all of them. Hawthorne, for example, seems to have deeply believed in the work that they were doing. However, I want to dispel the thinking that this was a different time and people did not know what they were doing was problematic. Sewell would write later in his life and express regret for his actions in the Salem Trials. Likewise, I think it's interesting that in the work, Wonders of the Invisible World, published in 1693, so the year after the trials ended, Cotton Mather wants the reader to be clear that he was neither present at said trials, nor did he have any kind of prejudice towards the accused. And while it is true that Mather was indeed not one of the judges, it is completely unfair to pretend that Mather did not have any influence in what was going on. It should also be considered that Mather himself did not necessarily oppose the use of spectral evidence. Mather viewed spectral evidence, as well as touch evidence, as being a useful tool for instigating a closer investigation. At no time, however, does it appear that he really protested it being used to get convictions, despite his efforts to comfortably insulate himself from the potential fallout. The first trial in Salem took place on June the 2nd, 1692. The first defendant was Bridget Bishop. Her place as a witch confirmed by Abigail Hobbs, Bishop was an easy test case for the new tribunal. Bishop was suspected of witchcraft long before 1692, having been previously accused of practicing witchcraft against her second husband. She was a far easier target than, say, Rebecca Nurse or Martha Corey. Bishop was formally indicted on June 2nd, and her trial followed in the same day. It is worth mentioning that she was not provided with a criminal defense attorney. However, that was not an uncommon occurrence under the then-existing law. The trial would proceed with the prosecution making their case, followed by Bishop being allowed to make a statement in her own defense. Throughout the course of June 2nd, testimony was heard about the specters of Bishop that would appear tormenting, chiefly by pinching the afflicted. Deliverance Hobbs, the also accused and confessed mother of Abigail Hobbs, would testify that it was the specter of Bishop that would appear to her and torment her following her confession. Beyond that, what followed was a wave of testimony simply focused on the bad character of Bishop. Among the evidence that was considered, there is an interesting note by Mather of the physical examination done on Bishop. Jurors reported seeing a preternatural teat on the woman's body. A few hours later, the teat was gone, which they took as proof of witchcraft. Evidence was admitted of the torture the afflicted went through during the examination, when Bishop simply looked at them. While Bishop would attempt to defend herself, her fate was all but sealed. Strauden gave the case to the jury, and Bishop was convicted. Just eight days later, on June the 10th, Bridget Bishop became the first victim of the Salem witch trials and was hung for her crimes. With the death of Bishop, it marked the beginning of the end of the allegations. There were claims after her death of bewitchment. However, there was a sudden and noticeable decline in the allegations being made in the colony. Almost immediately, there was some concern expressed about using spectral evidence, as it is something that is impossible to prove. William Strauden, however, would put that argument to bed, 
stating that specters could not be in the form of innocent people. For the Chief Justice, this was a powerful comment on the trials, which really clarifies the serious danger that the accused faced in front of this tribunal. We see in the trial of Rebecca Nurse, at the end of June, that she appears to have believed that the path to winning her trial was to go after the accuser's credibility, a tactic that would be repeated but ultimately would prove to be ineffective. During the second round of trials at the end of June, Sarah Good, Elizabeth Howe, Rebecca Nurse, Sarah Wilds, and Susanna Martin were all tried, convicted, and sentenced to death. They would all be executed on July 19th. During these trials, as was the case with Bridget Bishop, we see all kinds of questionable evidence being admitted. Beyond spectral evidence, touch tests were used whereby the accused would simply touch the afflicted to see what would happen. While Rebecca Nurse was probably going down the correct path, with a chief justice of the tribunal holding fast that the only explanation for a specter was guilt, there really was never all that much hope. Knowing that this was the position of the chief magistrate over the hearings, Unless you could somehow overcome the accuser with an attack on their credibility, which is what Nurse attempted, the presumption was going to be that you were guilty. Further complicating things for the accused is that the allegations were always coming from multiple people, which means that destroying the credibility of one was not good enough. You needed to tear down the entire group. This is how we are going to see things go moving forward. The third tribunal met in early August and it came to consider cases against John and Elizabeth Proctor, George Burroughs, George Jacob, John Willard, and Martha Carrier. All were found guilty and all were hung on August 19th, with the exception of Elizabeth Proctor. While she was found guilty, her execution was delayed because she was pregnant. The most prominent of this group was George Burroughs, who was a minister. This trial was a big deal as his prominent role in the church made Burroughs extremely high profile. Cotton Mather mentions that while he did not attend the trials in general, he was present for the trial of Burroughs. Mather then goes a step further and asserts that had he been a judge, he would have voted to convict. Burroughs was accused of murdering his two late wives via witchcraft. Burroughs faced allegations that he had used his supernatural strength to accomplish the feat. Despite being a member of the church and a minister in that church, Burroughs was convicted and was hung with the rest on August 19th. The large turnout for the trial of Burroughs is a powerful clue that he was seen as a central figure to this entire ordeal. As a supposed man of God, Burroughs would have had the following to potentially be a powerful linchpin in the crisis. Following the third session, there appears to have been a tactical change. To date, all of the executions had been of those who had proclaimed and continued to maintain their innocence. As this clearly was not working out, following the third session, confessions became the name of the game. Not wanting to head to the gallows and seeing that those who confessed by and large were not, it was time for people to save themselves. The final session of the court was called in September, and this time it was Giles and Martha Corey, Abigail Hobbs, Dorcas Hoare, Mary Esty, Mary Bradbury, Alice Parker, Ampudator, Wilmot Reed, Anne Foster, Mary Lacey, Margaret Scott, Abigail Faulkner, Rebecca Eames, Samuel Wardwell, and Mary Parker. Of that group, the Corries, Esty, Pudator, Reed, Scott, Wardwell, and Parker would all be executed. All of them were hung on September 22nd, with the exception of Giles Corey, who was pressed to death on September 19th. Of this group, it is worth noting that Samuel Wardwell had initially confessed to the crime, but later recanted. The recantation likely being a mistake, as now despite the confession, he was still convicted and executed. Giles Corey was the only person executed during the trials from a method other than hanging. This stems from the fact that Corey refused to speak or even enter a plea at trial. Such defiance was met with far more severe punishment as compared to a hanging. It is also worth a mention that Dorcas Hoare was sentenced to hang, but a last-minute confession bought her a reprieve. The fourth session of the court would be its final one. The court increasingly found itself being condemned because of its practices. Concerns had existed from the first hearing back at the beginning of June. 
However, those cries continued to grow louder with time. Potentially leading to the end of the tribunal is the fact that Mary Phipps, the wife of Governor William Phipps, was herself accused. Likewise, accusations that already lacked standards of evidence were further relaxed during the September sessions was damaging to the legitimacy of the court. It was in late October when accuser Mary Herrick confessed to John Hale that she now doubted her previous beliefs. Herrick made a statement that she was still being visited by the specter of the now-dead Mary Esty, who informed her that she had been wrongfully convicted. This was a huge deal. This was one of the accusers now admitting doubt in their own vision, which further called into question the reliance upon spectral evidence. It is unclear if the doubt by Herrick became publicly known at the time, though it would later when John Hale would write about the trials. Certainly, the trials ramped down following Herrick's statement. However, they come after William Phipps had already announced that the court was going to be reformed. Evidence does show, however, that following Herrick's statement, the entire process of reforming the trials, as well as attempts to show that everybody had likely been deceived by the devil picked up. This lends support to the theory that the comments made by Herrick were known, at least to the tribunal, if not more publicly. Either way, Herrick's statement goes a long way towards showing the shifting views towards the trials and highlighting that even now the accusers had begun to turn. Another set of trials was conducted in November. However, those trials were outside the established tribunal. Despite convictions, by this point it was clear that support for the trials was waning. Phipps, likely concerned over both the trials in general and the fact that his wife had now been named, announced that reform was coming in late October. In November, that change materialized in the form of doing away with spectral evidence and touch tests. With this change, it became nearly impossible to get a conviction for witchcraft. As it turns out, there was little other evidence available to prove that somebody had an alliance with Satan. An additional 52 people were tried for witchcraft in January and February of 1693. However, unlike the virtually assured conviction rate of the prior hearings, only three of the 52 were found guilty. Likewise, the ability to even get indictments became far more challenging for the prosecutors. In 1693, Increase Mather, having become one of the great opponents of spectral evidence despite his initial support, published Cases of Conscience Concerning Evil Spirits, which stated that it was actually possible that Satan could take the form of an innocent person, a position that directly contradicts the earlier holdings by the court and Strauden directly. This would in turn go a long way towards delegitimizing the entire series of trials. Just like that, nearly a year after it began, the witchcraft crisis in Salem reached its conclusion. At the end of the day, 20 people had been executed, not to mention several others that died in jail while awaiting trial. Next time, we are going to turn our attention to the two questions surrounding Salem. The first question is why the events that rocked the colony in 1692 happened in the first place. What motivated the events to take place and then directed their course throughout the remainder of the year? We are then going to examine the long-term repercussions and the legacy of the Salem witchcraft trials. Until then, I hope you all have a wonderful two weeks. I hope you are staying healthy and staying safe. And I will see you back here next time to discuss just how exactly this entire mess happened.